Ladies and gentlemen, just to remind you, as if it's not uh, obvious, we heard we're having a change of personnel at this point. Um, uh, uh, Ash Kandekar, who's the um, editor of Opera Now, will, will take over as the moderator, or the, uh, um, the well, in fact, the um, uh, dual role of uh, yes, indeed, <laughs> the griller for the first part of the conversation, and then um, uh, we'll be joined by. Um, uh, Hugo Shirley, who's the deputy editor of Opera magazine, who will um, join um, the trio. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I just thought we'd, we'd, we'd start uh, the session, um, which has got this rather intriguing title, which encompasses more or less everything about everything. I mean, it's, it's music, theatre between opera and drama, contemporary opera, modern staging, bad or good public. So I hope we are, <laughs> I don't know which sort of public we are, but we'll discover through the course of the session. And we've heard a lot about um, Mr. Mortier's ideas about opera and his sort of cerebral intellectual thoughts about opera. Um, I thought it might be interesting just to briefly um, uh, talk about um, Gerard himself and about his own sort of uh, perspective on the, on, on the opera world through his own life um, before we bring in Hugo and, and widen out the discussion to, to really um, contain all these different ideas that we've got in the, in the theme of the session. So, um, Gerard, here you are, you're, you're, you're um, Flemish. So you were born in the middle of the sort of European experiment. <coughs> uh, you, you, you were in Belgium for a long time. You've had contact with many, many different sorts of cultures. You've, you've been to uh, um, Salzburg. You've had a, a sort of a Germanic experience. Mm. You're now in a sort of a, a Mediterranean experience in, in Madrid. Um, and you've had uh, uh, brushes with Anglo-Saxon experiences. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, what... what do you feel is your cultural heart? Where, where do you where do you belong? Mm. Because again, talking about Mozart's journeys and how he sort of mm. didn't always fit in mm. where mm. he wherever mm. he went. I mean, mm. do you relate to that in any sort of way? You know where is my you know my center. I I, I would say that really my thinking is German. Um, I was born in in Flemish in Flanders, so I speak. Flemish and, and French, but uh, my education, let's say, in the music world, because I came from a very simple family, my parents uh, have always given me the chance to learn, but it was not a family intellectuals, they like music and literature, but so I had to study. I'm really an autodidact in, uh, in, in music, and it was Germany. Since I could uh, go to Germany, my first Opera was in Germany was Fraunhofer, <laughs> the famous one. Uh, we talked just about it. Um, the famous Oscar Fritschu uh, production, uh, conducted by Günther Wandt at that moment. So it was always I wrote at that time open world. I did read less opera. At, I wrote, but it was open world with. Uh, so that's uh, and that's very clear. I think so for the public. Uh, my, mm, I discussed with some students the dramaturgy in England is not so well known. And I felt that I would have never really had success in England as an opera director. Um, I felt this, I came once uh, for discussion. Mm, I think when I was in, uh, in Brussels still, if I would take over Covent Garden, I felt that wouldn't work. And uh, it's maybe there is a very different uh, approach of opera and the theatre is the same. When you look to the theatre, I, uh, I adore some, I adore Simon McBurney and, and Deborah Warner, but you feel in England the, the actor mm -hmm. is very important rather as the concept of, of a piece, I think so. Okay. Well, let, let, let's go back to this, this, this journey though. Were, were you, um, w when you went to Salzburg, it is a very traditional patrician place. It's where tradition, where tradition goes on for a very, very long time. It uh, has been going on for a very long time. Um, are, were you an iconoclast from the start? Was, I mean, people have called you an iconoclast. When you got to Salzburg, a lot of people were upset by your mm. appointment, even though they knew what they, what they were getting. You, you are you. I mean, you're not... Uh, uh, you don't invent yourself so much wherever you go. You get Gérard Mortier. There's sort of a brand, really, in the opera world, mm. which is... Gérard Mortier, and I wonder whether you have always set out 
because you come from an unintellectual, um, mm -hmm. you say yourself, simple back back background, whether that's something you took into the opera world and wanted to ass assert something different. Yeah, I, would, I want to make very clear because it's important that at the beginning I was really a bad canto lover. At the start, it was, it was the Opera House in Ghent. It was a provincial theatre. They only played La Juive, Les Huguenots, uh, you know, all this stuff I don't like so much anymore. But uh, that was my, my uh, education. And it was only then, because I played piano, that through the conservatoire I went in, in the classical music. We could never see a Mozart in Belgium, for example. Uh, and one sec, I studied from the first recording that was done. Uh, I only say that for public who says, but that's too difficult, we don't know music. That's not true. You can, if you want, go into the most complicated uh, thing. I want to say that before I went to Salzburg, because it's always dangerous now, I went in Salzburg in uh, 91, so that's uh, now 20 years ago. And in a biography, you start to rom romanticism, you know, you start to make your own mythology. So what, what I wouldn't like. What was for sure, that I didn't, uh, that was completely unexpected, my, um, my nomination. Uh, it was some people who wanted it very much. And I believe, when I now look back, that I came like Parsifal. Right. And uh, <laughs> I, I mean with that, that I didn't know the danger. Yes. I didn't, and if I would have known, I think I would never have gone. Right. <laughs> Uh, that's that's very important, yes. and you know me a little bit. I'm very convinced about what I'm doing. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's and that is not always good too because <laughs> you need people. I told when they be both is coming. I just know in Spain. I say first I get the picador and then the toreador. <laughs> so <laughs> you know, now I'm living in this, in this corridor. But I didn't know what what happened, and I felt it very soon. I have done no in. Uh, a lot of mistakes. I think a little bit, therefore, I like so much Mozart. I, I trapped in a lot of things, in declarations, you know, I always say a little bit what I think. And in Austria, they always say the contrary of the what I think. Mm -hmm. So that, <laughs> that it was very difficult for so me. So, so do, you w do you wish you'd never said, I don't know whether you said it, but you were reputed to have said, I hate Puccini. And it was interesting when you were go going through the list of, of composers that you would not program. And you couldn't even say the word Puccini. It's, 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 um, uh, you have felt I didn't say it. No. no. I <laughs> learned that it was a big mistake to say that yeah. because, of course, I know Puccini very well. And I, uh, and I say, yeah, I, I don't like Puccini or I hated Puccini. What is true? It's really the truth, but I shouldn't have said it but and, and not program it. And I could explain it's not hate. It's because I don't know what to tell. With, uh, with, and what I don't understand, if you want me to know, that everybody thinks Verdi and Puccini is about the same. It's completely different. It's two worlds, completely different. And um, for me, Puccini is a fantastic composer. And I think some, if I would choose, it would be Tabarro. But his stories doesn't interest me. I don't know what I have to tell about Bohem. That her hand is cold and he falls in love. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But in Traviata, I know exactly what I want to tell. But I would I have played always. Tosca is for me impossible. This is absolutely so sad and I, I don't <laughs> like it at all. The second act is for me unbearable. I go out. Mm. Because più forte, più forte, and all these things. But it was a good, uh, he knew what sells well. Yes. He was before the horror film, he did already <laughs> Tosca. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, he's, he's sometimes called the Spielberg of opera because he knows exactly how to m manipulate your uh, emotions yeah. without actually yeah. making you understand why you're feeling yeah. what you're feeling. Yeah, um, but, but I say yes. Verdi, you know, Verdi didn't like Puccini as well, you know yes. that. Okay, so <laughs> you're, you're in very good company, clearly. <laughs> and um, he said, you know, the difference would be what for me in opera, because people are singing mm. in opera, and singing is something very existential. And in Tosca, for example, if he would have sang at least at the end about freedom, instead of only, oh, she's not here and she should come and so on, uh, Tosca, it would give a completely different uh, picture of the opera, and that I, ex I attend. Otherwise, I go to a good, fi a good film. 
So for me, it's too much um, expenses for telling a story. You don't need the opera for that. Okay. Um, it's very interesting that one of your signature operas that you mentioned was Saint Francois d'Assise, and that's something I saw in Madrid uh, recently. Um, this idea of uh, spiritual conviction and an opera being able to carry one's own spiritual mm -hmm. convictions. Is that something that's important? Does, does, does San Francois, which is in a way a, a rite, a, a spiritual ritual, um, mm -hmm. does that speak to you particularly because of your upbringing and background? Yeah, and, and no, because I'm not very good, but I would say that uh, spirituality is for me very important. Uh, and I think that opera is a very spiritual uh, art form. And I will try to explain that. Uh, when you compare Wozzeck of Büchner with Wozzeck of Berg, at the end you have the spiritual moment. I, w I say with that uh, what starts in the opera with Claudio Monteverdi. When he does the Combattimenti de Tancredi and Clorinda, what is a really a dramatic recitative, and when uh, Tancredi discovers that Clorinda was his lover, but he killed, she opens the eye and sings, don't be afraid, Ria, I see already the light of heaven. This was a revolution in opera. And I think I always pretend, but uh, pretend that opera needs this spiritual dimension, what I miss in the Verismo, mm -hmm. what Verdi has always. In Verdi, someone is killed, and you hear then the harps and the flutes starting and singing this, uh, yeah not realistic music. And you have that in, in Wozzeck as well. And when I take Magic Flute, for example, or I take Cosi Fan Tutte, or I take Nozze di Figaro, you have always this. In Nozze, everybody has loved the other one, very much intrigued, and then comes this, after Contessa Perdono, you have this time is waiting. And then you go back to life. So that's something what I like very much. But I could understand that people uh, not always like it. It's a problem of Messiaen, because it's very Catholic inspired. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I tried, um, I tried to uh, do it um, in another way as well in Paris, but it didn't function so well. But uh, to have once uh, tell about spirituality, but it has not to do with, uh, with Catholicism or no. it, it has to do with a, with a mystic feeling. Yeah. Well, of course, this is something that can be very confused, the idea of religion and spirituality being yeah. the same thing. And, in, and the yeah. opera somehow can break that yeah. whole relationship open. And I yeah. think that... Your For me, it's a spirituality. Yes, it's yes. I think that the great power, why we are moved in opera most of the time is that there is something irrealist. I give another example, uh, Traviata. Only, therefore, I think it's a great work when at the end, uh, Violetta is dying and he comes in, both know that is the end. And he starts to sing, Parigi Cara, we go, my love, together back to Paris. And they sing this in a fantastic love duet. That's opera for me. And I think you need that to have great opera. That's what moves the, the public. This going out of the real world, but not to have a, dr a stupid dream, but really uh, something where you can believe. And that's Mozart. He says when all people are in the first finale, uh, then is the Himmel of Erd. Uh, then everybody, then the heaven is on earth. Mozart in the magic flute is from a spirituality enormous, but it should not be seen religious. It should be seen like you can have this morning. I walked along the Thames at Soyo. That's for me a very ex spiritual experience to, to see this marvelous country. It's a, I think to all the people who study here, that's such a privilege. <laughs> to be, yeah. It's so beautiful. This spirituality is important. So, so just before we bring Hugo in to, to talk more widely about, about things, um, it sounds as if opera for you, obviously it's more than just a job, it's, it's really informed who you are. Mm -hmm. um, it's informed your um, moral world even, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. Do you, think, do you think opera does have moral lessons to teach us and do you think it's, it shapes you as 
a person? More or less, it should be make conscience about the world in where we are living. Uh, you know, that's my, you know, that's my way of live. I have nothing what belongs to me. I have only my clothes and, and my books and so on. Otherwise, I'm not interesting. interested in having a possession. It was uh, very important in my life. The only thing I possess is the theater. <laughs> and uh, and I, that's in the sense of Moliere. Moliere said at the end of his life, uh, what you uh, the theater man has always to be prepared to take his car and go to another place to tell. I think that's very important. So, so the idea is of making journeys, just going back to Mozart, the idea of actually not being rooted, not not being fixed, no. but to be able to be to float around Europe or or the world or whatever it is, and 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 uh, absorb and also impact yeah. on, on the world. I think it's very important today uh, the art. In this, um, I, you know, I give a lot of conferences outside of the opera in a world who is really in a crisis of values, not of money. It's a value crisis that we people who work in the art, use the art to give directions where we should go. And therefore, I think I'm, I'm, I'm quite convinced, maybe I, I do uh, bad interpretations, I, can, um, I make mistakes, but I'm convinced of the power of the theatre and of the music. Uh, that in this time, and uh, that we, we if the music and theatre would have a greater role in society, like it had with the Greeks, but they disappeared also. But um, we could help Peter, uh, people better. And I believe that Mozart, uh, he, he, that he did uh, also, because we don't talk about so much about it, but Verdi did it. Verdi was very engaged in the, in the nationality of Italy. You know, for a composer like Verdi, at the end of his life, to, s to compose a fugue, the most complex fuga, of all this, all this Verdi, pum, pam, pam, yes. pam, pam. And he composed a great fugue to say the word in Shakespearean. That's, yeah. and we have to tell this to the public. That's for me, uh, very, and if you take all operas only about amusement, you kill the spirit of the composers, for my feeling. Thank you. Um, can we bring Hugo in at this point and... Um, <coughs> the Toreadono, <laughs> <laughs> the Torero. In, in Spain you can only talk about the Torero. <laughs> yes. um, uh, so I, d I don't think there's going to be blood, blood on the sand, um, <laughs> Gerard, today, but um, we, we, we should sort of really look at the idea of contemporary opera and perhaps mm. where, where opera is going to go in the future and and also look at this question of audiences, because one of the, the interesting things that you've said throughout this, this afternoon, uh, I've been listening to you, is the idea of my audience. Uh, you, you seem to take possession of an audience, and um, for you, um, it's not just the public, it's mm. my audience. Mm. Um, and perhaps we could deconstruct that a little bit um, between you. I mean, I mean do, do, you, do you think there is um, a coherent, um, idea of audience, um, Hugo, is, is there such thing as a sort of a single entity that is an audience? Um, in reality, no, they can't be because obviously everyone has the same, everyone has their own reaction to any performance, mm -hmm. but it, in, in practical terms, um, the tendency is always for audiences to be lumped together as a kind of... Um, community. Yeah, well, or a, a community, a mob, Whatever, <laughs> whatever the particular reaction but, but, to something but, but can I, be. I, I, th I think it's interesting that Gerard seems to be saying something different. He's not. He's not just saying that an audience is sort of a, uh, has to be seen as a whole, but that but that actually the audience has to be made to almost made to think as a whole. That that, that you're mm. you're presenting ideas to them, which you want them to interpret mm. in a certain way, or it to interpret because it's an organism. It's not I give you. I give you a link. <laughs> I think I can tell it very well when I see you. I would I like to create my audience, that's very clear. Mm. But out not of the lovers, I always think that the people who are maybe not aficionados of the opera, I can convince better as one who already think they know very well Mozart. So and, uh, there is a very interesting, um, there is uh, what I say always, I, Corneille and Racine, the two great classical uh, French writers, we know that they said, um, uh, the one Corneille wrote for a public how he would like to be. 
and Racine wrote for the public how it was. I am Corneille, <laughs> if, I may, if I, may, I may explain that. So I would w I like to make opera for an ideal public how I would wish it, but that's not there. So I hear it, boo, and everything, and so on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the, my greatest, I have to say it, my greatest experience was after the famous Evigenie in, in Paris was uh, Mortier au Boucher. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I all could answer, I'm the first Jeanne d'Arc of the opera. But that's the only thing, I, but you're right, um, the public doesn't exist that way. But to tell you, I would like this way. But I think you can convince, I always have convinced part of them. I was going to say, I mean, do, you, do you feel, because the way you wound up the talk about um, the Salzburg Festival and Hoffman style the other night was um, this hope in, in the, and, and you you've repeated a bit of it just, um, just, just then, that uh, in this difficult time, mm. there's more of a need for arts than ever mm. before. And... Um, that allied to this sort of idealistic, almost didactic attitude towards the audience to present them with something that they should be seeing rather than what they want to see. Mm. Um, that actually seems to be going back to the, exactly the roots of the, the Salzburg Festival. Mm. And it's, it's kind of ironic in a way that that's um, it's, it's now become um, having being in Salzburg and ruffled so many feathers, um, you're now repeating a, 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 an attitude that seems to be quite similar to, to the sort of reactionary um, healing idea that, that Hoffman style had at, at the beginning. And I was just wondering whether, the, whether you feel you're maybe mellowing at all or... No, <laughs> is no it I would say that I am really convinced that I, uh, you know, when you look to the history of the festival, well, my ten years, the five first years, I tried to build up the idea of Hoffman style again, and then I say, but I have to go a step further, and I completely am convinced that that was the right way, losing some feathers, but at the same at the same time, these feathers are still there, and um, so they are obliged. But yeah, if I may go in history of opera with the public. When you look to the public, that's something very strange in the opera. I have uh, really thought, this is a very interesting team, I think so. And you have the same because you write for a public. The opera is an art form who was really an invention of very academic people. Uh, it, it, the most art form, you know, was out of a of uh, something you wanted, you know, when you started to design or you wanted to start to make music or to start to dance, it was a natural reaction of communicating with other people. The opera is absolutely an artificial product done by academics in Florence, afterwards uh, Monteverdi. So I think in opera you will have always this mixture uh, of the fact that you have to look for a public and that the public many times wants a different thing than what you are doing. I think when you go through the history of opera, and this is very interesting, you should maybe once or our student <laughs> should write a, 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 a book on that, about public and opera. So you feel that Mozart also wanted another public as the one who was there when you read, uh, really. Meyerbeer exactly wrote the operas the public wanted. Puccini wrote exactly the operas you wanted. Verdi, no, you know, the Nabucco at the beginning. He wrote the Call of Slaves that they wanted, but the great singing of the Abigail was in that time, woof, they never heard about this. So it's very typical for the opera that the opera had to look for his pub public, it's an artificial art, and the public is all wants many times something different as the composer or the organizer is doing. I think that's a basic point but in but opera. But it's interesting, do you feel that somewhere like the Ruhr 
uh, Triennale, where you were you also yeah. uh, artistic director, and you, uh, which is a sort of industrial uh, part of Germany with interesting uh, buildings and warehouses where you put on opera, uh, with a very different sort of public to Salzburg. Do you think that suits you more in the sense that does your public in in uh, in, uh, in in the Ruhr Festival get you yeah. more than they did in Salzburg? Yes, I would tell you how it worked. Um, when I was at the end of Salzburg, because that can help us for for going on. I was invited, there was two possibilities. I had 10 years Salzburg, then I was invited to go to Venice to open the Teatro La Finice, and I was very interested. But as finally, after two days of visit, I say, you will do again the same in Salzburg, make a festival for a jet set, mm. uh, where you have to, to realize. And I went the next day to the Ruhr, and it was definitive that I wanted, at that moment of my, my career, making so completely new, giving something to a public who was completely open. But that didn't change my opinion that it was very important that it's Salzburg because I learned so much and I opened for a new public. So I think uh, this uh, context with the public, this fight many times with the public, is very important and creative for me. I mean, would but you I suffer many times, you know. When oh. <laughs> I mean, would, would you have, um, for the sake of argument, play devil's advocate slightly? Um, because I think we probably will get on to um, modern, yep. well, modern productions, uh, whether modern people opera. interpret that as good or bad. Um, the way the way you say you you only you only tackle an opera if you can tell something with the opera. Yeah. Do you ever have any sympathy for people who think the opera has enough to tell by itself and doesn't need any additional? Um, yeah, but when they say it has to tell by themselves, they tell something too. Well, they, they, well they, 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 it's, a, it's a roundabout way of Because asking, they invite um, a conductor, they invite a stage director, so in any way, everyone, uh, every opera director, he doesn't let the work on himself, he, he always engages. But the way, the, way I un, the way I understood the way you say you, only, you would only stage an opera if, if you could make it tell something, mm -hmm. the way I understood that is you meant you could only, you could only engage with it if you could make yeah. it tell something in a um, contemporary context. Yeah. I must correct myself, I would say if the opera tells, but tells the, what it wanted to tell at the beginning. But you have to know an opera was composed 200 years ago and the times are changing, and it's for sure that Mozart living now would have written different. He would have written other music. Uh, you, you know, he wrote out of his tradition. So I think we have, as an opera director, my job is to make secure that the communication, why a composer wrote this piece, still gets over. Uh, and maybe I can be wrong, maybe it's my interpretation wrong, but in any case, the composer, the artist who make the work, who is really the creator, he wanted to tell something. But do, but do you think the way you do that is is to put something into a modern context? No, not to, always. I mean, no. So, for example, you know, when it says somebody's killed with a sword and you use a gun, is that necessarily being more illuminating in no. any way about the... No, that depends, yes, that, depends. Yes, yes, that, yes, depends. Yes. that depends, that depends, that depends absolutely. But to think that a Shakespeare Macbeth is better when you play it in a medieval castle with a golden <laughs> crown and a red mantle is completely well, wrong. Why, why it's, against, <laughs> it's completely against yes. Shakespeare. I mean, we, we seem to be very, very happy, certainly in Britain, to, to see um, productions of, of theatre updated, but opera seems to have a sort of a, uh, a rather reverential um, air around it, which perhaps it doesn't in Germany so much, uh, where uh, Regie Theater is, we were talking about director-led theatre, where you, you see you know, very, very contemporary updatings of traditional work, um, which even in Germany, I think, is becoming um, more criticised now than it, yeah. uh, than it used because to be. Because it's so bad at the yes, moment. Yeah. It's really bad <laughs> regie theatre. Very bad. Yeah, yeah. I'm not a man of regie theatre. Mm. If you ask me, no. For me, it's the musical is the force of the music. But we have to to be clear. I will tell you. Uh, for example, uh, all pieces who have to do with Shakespeare. You cannot say. Verdi has told very often what are the witches, how he will put it on the stage. 
no to pretend that you have to need if you don't have a medieval castle on the stage and you have not the ropes and the, and the golden uh, cups here during the banquet scene you cannot do Macbeth that's against the opera Verdi that's very stupid I would say because in the time of Shakespeare there was no uh, there was no uh, sets and the historical costumes if I may say is an invention of the 19th century mm. before all theatre was always in the contemporary costume that was the way in Ludwig XIV was in the co costume of so the invention of the historical staging what you say no that's an invention of the 19th century but but nevertheless there is a difference between something that's relevant and something that's modern you know yeah. the, the relevance isn't contained in set design or costume I mean no. that, that there's something that that goes beyond that yeah there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a danger I, th I think when when um, people refuse well being obsessed with putting not saying for one moment <laughs> you are, but something I mean, there's a, a an obsession in some quarters with have, having um, operas in a modern setting just for the for for no particularly good reason and it actually has sometimes the effect of implying that there's nothing relevant in the the period that it's set mm -hmm. and kind of relegating the historic period to this kind of picture book world mm -hmm. um, and it also slightly undermines this idea particularly for example with, with Mozart that when when we're talking about Mozart it only being possible to understand Mozart's works within the context of his life to then not set the opera as a matter of principle in the time of his in a contemporary setting to him it kind of has this paradoxical effect of making the time of his life seem irrelevant mm -hmm. and it's this sort of weird circular paradox but a <laughs> modern public what they know about the time of Mozart they didn't live in it you know, you know, it, you, you have, we have another conception of time. When you think that Mozart needed uh, one day to travel 25, uh, uh, 15 miles, and now you travel in the same day you travel to Tokyo, it's another feeling. So you have to take in account that you live in another way of listening without, uh, in the time of Mozart, no babas, no Facebook, no Twitter. Uh, <laughs> this is now existing. You cannot do as if it do doesn't exist. So you have to take account we live in a time that this theater works for a younger public also, has his power. It's not in putting historical, uh, let's say, we don't know, historical plays or, or historical costume, that you make it clearer for the public. You see, Tosca's fate would have been so different if she'd had a mobile phone, you see. And, um, no, no, no. <laughs> I don't want mobile phones on the phone. That, that, uh, that's, uh, the that, stage, that's yes. But uh, that makes the piece very difficult. Yes, in Mozart, you would never think of it of putting a mobile phone on the phone. I, I don't think so. Well, but no, we, are living in <laughs> we are living in another time. I, I, what, what I want to explain that it's for me quite abstract to say but it's, uh, the time of Mozart was another one as nowadays and we have other experience, our hearing experience, our seeing experience are different as in the time of Mozart because it was not electricity, it always was seen with candlelight so what it means that to go historical, but I don't understand this uh, I think we live in a, in a time and if you, like I did here, if you can use I would say if you use a rococo costume, you have to put it between how yeah, yeah. Yeah. that you feel it that's a citation of rococo costume. The best example I have always uh, one of the really people I don't like as stage director is Zeffirelli. And when you look to the Romeo and Juliet of Zeffirelli with the historical costumes with the young uh, DiCaprio, these are two American teenagers in Renaissance costumes. They didn't change uh, because most of the people now they even don't know how to go with a long rope. I see always I laugh with the chorus that you see, see that they are uh, having jeans and then on the stage they, they run around in costumes you see they don't know how to take a costume because already on the steps they cannot come down with this costume because they fall down. I, I exaggerate but um, this you have when as soon on the theatre you use a set or a costume, 
it's always theatrical. Reality in theatre doesn't exist. So everything you use, when I put this on the theatre, it has another sense of sitting here. <coughs> when I put a cravat, it's a certain sign of a, a mode during a certain time. You understand? What I tried to explain, but it's difficult. I, I discussed with Peter Brook about that. How can you put a cravat in Mozart? We, 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 we discussed about it. So that's a discussion I like very much. Mm -hmm. I say for Don Giovanni, yes. For not a difficult, no. <laughs> Do you ever feel there's a, and this is to be kind of um, about as sacrilegious as one can be, but do you ever feel there's a problem with the score itself? For example, with Don Giovanni, when you have all these um, codified musical forms that audiences at the time would be able to understand as relating to different classes. And these days, obviously, that yeah. can't be communicated. No, um, no, you can, you can. I, I think you can. Well, not in purely musical yeah. ways, but... You but, um, of course, that is for me very important. You have to start with the score. And it's very clear that in the score of Don Giovanni, Donna Anna sings in another Italian as Donna Elvira. That's Da Ponte. But most of the people doesn't know it, and most of the critics doesn't know it either, if I may say. But that's a different, that's a different, uh, and, this, and the, the, the song of Mazzetto was really a song of Hungarian revolutionary uh, paysan. Well, it's, uh, and that I want, you can feel many times, or you have to have a transposition. That was maybe the one in my Don Giovanni No, where I felt, I discussed about that, that I didn't feel enough that the group around Serlina was another social class. So that was my own critic on my own production. So I have this too. Uh, but that's the score. But now on the interpretation of the score, you know also that a score is a writing down of a musical idea. And it's always only a photocopy. Therefore, you can interpret Mozart in different ways. And I wouldn't say this is better as this one. You can really, uh, when you compare a Muti interpretation with Hanancourt, I can understand that some people say, but Muti has something to tell also with this. So I think it would be wrong to think you have only one interpretation of the score. I think you can go, for example, the Tempi, an adagio, it plays in function of the allegretto you are doing in front of that. So if the allegretto is quicker, the adagio has to be quicker. And most of the andantes are too slow because andante is caminar, it's andante, it's walking. So that's for me very important. But the problem is that at the moment this culture doesn't exist anymore. The greatest part of the public has not this musical <laughs> culture. And if I may say to critics, um, Two-thirds of the critic is most on the staging, on the music, to conduct it be uh, very beautiful uh, with a lot of dynamic. Well, can I just say that's because the sub-editors cut out everything about music. And I know, but that's <laughs> a problem. <laughs> but that's, that's the problem. No, I would say in England and in America, much more on music. In Germany, goes down. And that's maybe the quality, in, I would say, of the more Anglo-Saxon press, mm -hmm. that you read more about music. But that's, and there we would have to uh, learn the public, to, to explain them. Uh, that you're but, but again, the problem is, you're talking about each, the school can have a, an interpretation, um, have all, all manner of interpretation, and then when someone's writing about that interpretation, then that, that ends up being another kind of performance on its own, mm -hmm. which people can't necessarily understand in the, mm. in the same terms. Mm. So it's a, it's a difficult thing it's to a do, difficult. isn't it? It's, it's complex, um, but opera is very complex mm. in any case. Yeah. Yeah. Can we, can we <laughs> just, um, um, we, we've dealt a little bit with contemporary production, mo modernising productions, but perhaps we can talk about modern opera and the contemporary voice. You said yeah. that if Mozart was writing opera now, he wouldn't be writing, of course, in the style that he, he was. What is the contemporary style? What, for you, makes good contemporary opera? Yeah. Uh, contemporary, yes. yeah. Uh, may I say one thing about, you know, the ring, you know, that the one who was most dis uh, desperation about <laughs> the ring staging was Wagner himself, yes. no? <laughs> so Wagner was very simple, he said, we will create the invisible theatre. Yes. <laughs> so to say how complicated 
the discussion we had mm. is. And it's very difficult now because you can only concrete go in and you must be careful. I think you should not split up modern and, and uh, historical. I think it's more complex, I would say, and many times it works as well. No, modern opera is a very good question. If there was something I would like to tell to the public uh, that's already about contemporary music. It's something I discovered myself in a discussion I had with a great physician because I never understood why it's so difficult to convince people of contemporary music. And why it's so easy, many times they go to see Picasso, and it's already a little bit old-fashioned, but uh, let's say, no, the Biennale, but that's more fancy as uh, really art, um, and there is some art, but why is this different? That the public can very quick go to uh, modern Tate, always full, uh, or uh, a MoMA in New York, and why contemporary music is so difficult. And he explained me, it's the first time I thought of it, that the eye works different as the ear. The eye is digital, and the ear is mechanic. I never thought of this, but the physicians here, <coughs> uh, maybe, and therefore, the adaptation of the ear to contemporary takes a longer time as the eye. This was for me an interesting, so that was to defend the public and I learned that you have never to say to the public, oh you're stupid, you don't understand. I learned that really in music you need time. And I would say that Beethoven, if you wouldn't have listened a lot to this, the pastorale, you wouldn't understand either. Or Bruckner, let's talk about Bruckner. You have to listen a lot before you get the structure of this score. So that's the first problem. It's a problem of contemporary music that I learned to accept that the public needs time to get into it. What I learned also that you get more in contemporary opera of nowadays if public starts to listen well to the classics, I would say, Peleas, uh, Bocek, uh, it helps. And therefore I start always when I come somewhere, not with creations, but with the great classicals of the 20th century. And now the Wozzeck in Madrid, very conservative, was a huge success, also the Saint-Francois. So that's a step forward to in contemporary art. The really problem for me of is, was of course, and that's very dangerous what I say, and I would like musician maybe, is that of course with um, the only few composers know how to treat the voice. And I know the great success for my feeling of the George Benjamin uh, opera is that George Benjamin really studied how to compose for the voice, and I know the first opera he did for me into The Little Hill mm. was a marvelous writing for the voice. Yeah. Not bel canto, but out of the voice. Another one who did it fantastically, Janacek, and I think that's the reason why Janacek is very loved in, in England too, because Janacek came out of the melody of the speaking. And that's what is really missing nowadays. Composers who want to compose an opera and doesn't study how the voice is into the opera because uh, the voice, the singing, is the center of the opera. We know that Wagner was the first one to put a question mark on that, but you have to sing well to have a good yes. Wagner <laughs> when you look, but he did it on another way. And that's, I think, one of the problems. Now the third point, I would say, and then I finish, is that of course, with all this problem of contemporary music, more difficult for the public. Secondly, a lot of modern composer who doesn't know how to write for the voice. And third, that with the film coming up, and really the author film, that there is a great concurrence for the opera who doesn't, didn't exist in the 19th century. It becomes very difficult to make an opera in this time who you really need a lot of times you say, oh, but this story, I, I would like to see it more rather in the cinema, for example. Now it starts, for example, the music, in, uh, a parenthesis, at the moment in film, 
the great discussion how to use music started now also, you know, with Lars von Trier, that you have only to use live music and not like in Spielberg, you know, this horrible Amistad where you hear the whole time symphonic music during the slavery, you think, what is this symphonic orchestra <laughs> doing there? <laughs> when I see all the Negroes on, <coughs> on the boat, you know, the, I thought the worst film I saw one of the last years, because this music was so horrible, mm. but had to do to nothing with, with, the, with the, and you see Jurassic so Park without the music doesn't function <laughs> at all, <laughs> no? you know, very interesting. Yes. Um, so these all are the problems nowadays for contemporary opera. And I think that we have to accept, I as an opera director, that opera is not anymore the art form of this time. So we have to give a creations, but we have to know also it's very difficult to get on a level where you say this takes, that's an opera who will go in the future. Do you, th do you think that to that could be added a, th a fourth problem that actually a lot of um, contemporary composers are trained within a kind of mo arch modernist yeah. um, aesthetic that yeah. is not really very well suited to dealing with the kind of spiritual side of things that you were talking know. about as being essential to opera. But spiritual is very modern too, huh? Well, <laughs> but, but it relies on, on kind of being able to give a, an emotional payload that sometimes is not. Difficult discussion where you're going well. to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's no, but this it's is why I'm asking the question. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting in a way that uh, we've just seen in, 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 in London, that there's just been a run of um, uh, for Nicholas. I will, I will May, may I say something? Yeah, sure, of course. The problem is that the emotion now, when it comes out of the music, in the way at the moment the music is used, you must know that's the first time that music is really used to sell. That didn't exist in the 19th century. I mean, sell other things. You use mu music to sell a perfume. That didn't exist. That's new. So you have to create the music in the heralds and all these things to sell, because the music was created. You know, we have studies enough about it. There's this famous Mursak music never too high, never too low, uh, very <laughs> simple melodies where you can go what you have The music where you are living, then the whole in the radio, uh, that 85% is rock, pop and everything you want, then uh, the coming up of the jazz music, the difference. We live in such a new time, you must, the greatest part of the population uh, only listen to bad music. And I say not that pop is bad music, I think it is I always say, you know, my, I think that Bob Dylan is much bigger as Pavarotti, <laughs> you know, if you, I, I always say. Uh, you Pavarotti you can forget, but Bob Dylan, no, that's a, <laughs> that's a point. So I'm not, I uh, see, but it's very difficult now. We are a lot of uh, rubbish in music. And therefore, the ear is an, uh, inappropriate now to, it's so difficult to really listen. For example, Lachenmann. We know the great uh, German composer Helmut Lachmann, mm. I believe is a great composer. But of course, when you do this, that all becomes music. Mm. And in a world where you hear all the time something, mm. it's different, it's, it's e e very difficult to do. Therefore, I think with the modern, it, it, the, uh, the music of Lachmann is very spiritual. Mm -hmm. when you go into it, because he makes every noise to music. It, it, it means that in this noisy world, uh, he makes from noise again music. That's already very spiritual, I think so. That, that can be music. We forgot about this. Mm. And, uh, but that makes it very complicated. So I think the opera will not uh, survive as a creative artwork. Excuse me for the younger people, <laughs> but I, I would say that Opera will disappear as a creative art form for me. Well, one of, one, one of, one of our themes here is music theatre between opera and drama. And the idea of um, opera ceasing in terms of stories being told through music, surely that's, uh, that, can, that must be a perpetual need in, 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 in our human DNA, mm. that we need to tell stories through sound, through music, whatever, however that sound is organized. Mm -hmm. Organized sound will tell stories mm -hmm. and that to some extent is opera. So where, where is the end of opera? Yeah. yeah, but for a lot of young people now, they say about love, I, I listen to a marvelous song, 
uh, and that tells me more as, uh, as Tosca Visitarte, no? And they are right. <laughs> On top of that, they are right. You know, how I can defend Visitarte nowadays? I can defend this, opera, this music. You know, there, I, there are so many beautiful songs in jazz, uh, Ella Fitzgerald about love, and nowadays in some modern songs, who tells me so much more about love as this Visitarte. Well, t well, tell us a little bit about this, Philip Blas, because one of the things I think we would like to discuss yeah. is, is the, um, the Perfect American, which is uh, the opera that's just been uh, performed at ENO, um, which hasn't been particularly well reviewed in, 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 in this current uh, uh, manifestation, but of course there is this relationship between music and the words, and the words have been very criticised. The, the great climax of the opera is uh, somebody approaching Walt Disney and, uh, and the, the, the whole stage comes to a standstill and somebody proclaims to Walt Disney, um, you are nothing more than a mediocre CEO. And this becomes the sort of great theme of the opera, and it seems a rather banal, banal idea yeah. in a way that, um, um, that... I will give you very yes. honestly my, yes. under the condition that it's not published. Yes. <laughs> 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 no, we have to be careful many times because I'm already... No, I think <laughs> <laughs> that this Philip Glass opera, you know what was a command of me, you know, I convinced yes, Philip Glass yes. to do it. It's not a great opera. Mm. I think that the opera um, is good from the Lincoln scene on. And in the beginning, it's too slow, uh, and then it goes better with the Andy Warhol scene. If the people have seen it, so I have a. a <coughs> but what I love with Philip Glass, is that he composed operas, uh, and he composed uh, about twenty, at, at, I think, and there are some very beautiful music. If you ask me, Stefano from Verdi, rubbish for me too. You know, a Protestant, Domini, who sings bel canto. It's absolutely unbelievable. Mm. The Protestant is Bach, it's the contrapunt. It's yes. not uh, bel canto. It's not, uh, so I cannot stand out this opera because for me that doesn't work together. Mm. But, uh, so I think this opera, that such operas must be done too because the public likes it quite. Uh, it's most of the time, so it, I would compare it with uh, that opera it keeps up and it's not a genius peep. I think the problem is that Philip Glass was afraid of the Disney family right. and he was afraid that uh, the, they would uh, uh, kill it, uh, they would uh, prohibit uh, the opera and that's the problem because the book on base of what it was written, I discovered a book in Paris it's a very interesting book. Can I, can I just ask you about the, the curatorship process of creating a new work? So when the Philip Glass was being developed, were you part of that development? So you could say at some point, oh. I don't think this is working. We have done a lot. The libretto, the first version, was horrible. Right. I and thought the last version was pretty horrible. So <laughs> <I'm thinking. laughs> More horrible. <laughs> I would say, no, I would say the, la the, the sec from the part and then... I think the scene with the boy, I don't know the people who didn't see it, it's now a little bit in detail. The scene with the boy is quite beautiful, I think so, when the, with the, with the young, young people. But I think it will be an opera we will forget, uh, we will forget about it, like some other ones. But you never know. Uh, so, but you come in, in any case we changed already a lot, but that doesn't mean that you... Uh, it was enormous success in, in, in Madrid, very strange enough, sold out the whole time. So it's very interesting, but Fille du Régiment is sold out too. Yes. So it doesn't <laughs> say nothing about <laughs> Fille du Régiment. <laughs> uh, wh wh what are your feelings about contem contemporary work, um, Hugo? Is it, is it something that, as a critic, you, you find more difficult to write about? Um, yeah, obvi obviously it ends up being more more difficult because oh. um for me too and and this is something actually you you see on on the on the blogs a fair amount that um whenever anyone has a difficult difference of opinion with a particular critic then they wheel out the standard that hans lick didn't like wagner right. sort of critics from the past who didn't like and it's a, it's a very easy way of um I don't and, and and i think critics tend to be aware of their kind of opinion forming role a lot more when when they're writing about about mm -hmm. something new and 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 these new works they often need three or four hearings to mm -hmm. really get to grips with 
But you I must mean, know that the most uh, great operas we know in the history was always bad criticized at the beginning. Ex exactly. Yeah. The and and critic, critics are only too aware. The butterfly so of Okochini, Nabucco, of, you know, and, and, and Berk. Oh, that was very horrible criticized. And, and Stravinsky, you know, what, 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 yeah. So I think that's normal. And it's yeah. because the critics have their conservative uh, part too, like the public. So it's normal that they, the, and the ones who wrote well, like Adorno, uh, was for other purposes too. So I think that's normal. And I think I don't blame them. Uh, it's very difficult. Uh, to uh, to after one audition, even if you had seen the score, when they can read the score, but if you have seen it, I cannot read a contemporary score, very complicated, I can't read it. So if a critic says he can, I say, bravo, I cannot. <laughs> uh, you know, I cannot read Lachenmann, I must say, I, have, I need help to, to find out. But, um, so it's normal that you need to see it several times. Uh, I don't think I will convince you ever about a perfect American. No, <laughs> and no, it's, it's not a problem. But I understand that great art has to be challenging, that it's not, it can't be a simple process. But no, uh, no. Um, I, I, just, I, I would like to actually open up the discussion with the audience uh, a bit quite soon. Yeah. Uh, we've, got, we've got about just uh, half an hour to go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, perhaps we could just end this little part by talking about uh, the role of new technology uh, in opera, um, the, the idea of being able to, well, for one thing, screen operas and live relays and putting it into the cinema. The other thing is actually bringing technology, so having 3D opera, we've just had um, uh, our first 3D opera, uh, The Sunken Garden, last, uh, hopefully. <laughs> which you were very rude about, um, Hugo. And you fact, most people were actually. So you liked it or not? No. Oh, no, I didn't write about it. Oh, didn't, oh, it was Rupert, 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 Rupert Christensen was, was right, very yes. rude. Yeah. I thought I read something on a... a Bad or good? good. Bad, bad, bad. bad. Um, but what, what, what is, what is your? I mean, is it just a gimmick, or is it actually a? a I think way it's of many times a gimmick. Yeah. I would say, uh, for me, modern technology is only interesting if it tells something more. If really, but it's many times ornamental. So I don't think that an opera production will be better because you use video. You know that I didn't use it very much. I, we did it once with with Peter Sellers in the Saint-Francois, what was not for me very... Uh, but Peter Sellers wanted to do it in the beginning, no. But then we did Peter mm. Sellers, the famous Tristan, mm. with Bill Viola. Mm. And that was for me, it's a, an example of how you can, s with sense, use video in opera. But it was interesting that it's three acts, and Bill Viola worked six months on this. And you find out that himself, in doing the video, came more more profound what should video be. The first act was very narrative and was less good. The second act, where he has the great monologue of Marke, where the tree is there and only the sunrise was much better and the last act fantastic. Mm. And for the first time at the great visual emotion with the last act. Normally for the last act, Tristan, I only need the music. Because otherwise the tenor is turning around the right, one <laughs> on the right. Uh, so it's uh, the only one is Wieland Wagner. He did it quite fantastic in the, his time. And the video made clear, I think could help the public, everything what was in this music. For example, the famous uh, hobo uh, English horn solo at the beginning who comes back that this was a song he heard as a child, what many times would people who doesn't read, that helped. So I would say I'm not, I'm not thinking, I think for example Robert Lepage of Audrey to <coughs> create this enormous machine, I don't know if you need that to do a ring. Uh, but I would say we should use the modern technology in staging if it really is uh, more. But most of the time it's only used to or as an ornament, what I never like. And, and does it work in the cinema? I mean, do, would you use your critical faculties differently if you were seeing an opera in a cinema to, to seeing it on, oh, yeah. on stage? Well, yeah, of course, because you can't, for a start, you can't assess the physical characteristics of a voice because it's always, it's always amplified, amplified yes. to such a degree. And, and you obviously get a very different view of the... Um, of the production. 
I and hate it. <laughs> I it's very like clear. <laughs> I hate it absolutely. I will tell, when I was young, I saw some productions, but this idea, and I had big, then I become very passionate, this idea of telling that you have only democratic in showing uh, your productions uh, on Champs Elysees in Paris, uh, not a city where one million people can go to the live opera year is completely crazy. Uh, I, I, I believe that the, to have DVD, to have CD is already fantastic in a certain way that you can listen at home, you can study. But you know the negative effects, you know, with the, star, uh, the stars and, and that you have to have now 15 Toscas at home instead of co buying <laughs> Lachenmann ones to yeah. listen. Um, <laughs> I will always come back <laughs> to Tosca. Tosca. <laughs> but, uh, Died in vain. I, 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 I propose, it may be interesting for you, I propose to Peter Gelb, I was at the Paris Opera when he started, mm -hmm. I think he's the greatest uh, commercial opera director. So just, I'm sure you all know Peter Gelb's the Peter Gelb is of the Metropolitan. He he's runs the Metropolitan uh, Opera. No, already six years. No, I think he's one of the greatest uh, promotional men. I, I can learn a lot of him. But he, I, I don't know if he's so interested in art. He's very in, in promoting, <laughs> selling, and so on. Um, what I told him, when we bring the public outside of the house and we want to convince them of opera bring them in the opera so i propose you you make me your productions out of the met in the paris opera and at the same time i give you one of my productions in the met of course they didn't work <laughs> because he wanted to promote the met yes. and not our productions and now we see for the first time that the public is reduced in the metropolitan because the americans say when we can see in atlanta in the cinema, uh, Tosca, uh, for, for why we should go to the Met to see Tosca. For a quarter Tosca. of the price, yes. Exactly. For the quarter of a price. I think, so. I think it's very dangerous because what you need is the life experience of. You can listen to at home to Bruckner, but when I never listen to music at home, only uh, chamber music. Uh, because I, I want to go <coughs> to the concert hall, and you can go very cheap to the concert hall, uh, but and no, you can download, in any case you can listen, but you cannot, I think we have to fight for the life experience of music and of opera. Thank um, you. Um, can, can, we, can we open this up a little bit now and perhaps have some questions from, from the audience? And the, I think this you is, um, this is Gerard's, oh yes. <laughs> this is Gerard's opportunity to assess whether we are a good or a bad public. Um, <laughs> so, so can we have some good questions, please? Um, uh, if anybody wants to rush to the defence of Tosca or whatever, but uh, there's a lady in the red. Um, I'm an opera critic for musical opinion, and I haven't yet seen a production where an opera has been set in a modern setting which hasn't actually disrupted and invalidated what the composer meant to say about the time and the context and the situation. Which operas, particularly amongst the most famous ones, do you think could be transposed into a different time setting and still maintain everything the composer and the librettist wanted to say? I told already a little bit. It depends. I think most of the operas can be transposed, even if you don't accept it. Um, but for some, it's maybe difficult because in theatre, if theatre is really good, it's not related typically to the time where it was written. Shakespeare, for me, you can put it in all times. And the less dated you see a costume or a set in Shakespeare, the better, because the text says everything. The text describes uh, what you need to, to know. So I don't very feel the same what you say. I think, uh, of course, I would never transpose Meyerbeer because he was composed for his time. And Meyerbeer is not interesting enough to, uh, I know they did it in, uh, to play that and a swimming pool. Uh, that I think it's uh, ridiculous. But I would say to play uh, Wagner in the sets Wagner described is very ridiculous. You have, it's a mythology. And if someone can tell me how the gods are costumed, I would be <laughs> happy to know. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to ask 
you said that Puccini wrote what the public wanted, but do you actually think that he was shifting and adjusting and even going against his own wishes by doing that? No, but I am not against it. But I think he wrote. He was like a like a musical uh, writer. He he had a very good feeling for theatrical effect, and therefore I accept that it happens. I don't know what to do with this. Uh, what to do? For example, with Manon Lescaut, what is a beautiful roman of Abbé Prévost Priv about a young girl, seventeen, eighteen years old. And when you write there a vocal score for full orchestra, where at the end you have to cry very loud, where you can never have the girl to sing that, you know, which is, I think it's, I, I, I don't feel this opera, Manon of Massenet, has much more to do with Abbe Prévost. Therefore, I would never play Manon Lescaut of Puccini because the music already is completely in opposition with the story of, of Manon. They will do it now. Tillemann does it next year, and Rattel will do it. Manon Lescaut is the new yeah, great yeah, opera yes. of Puccini. So that's my problem. Therefore, I don't play this opera because already the mistake was done by the composer that he transformed. Why is it a mistake? Why can't it just be Puccini's interpretation of Manon Lescaut through but his own No, but he takes, then who should have taken? What you would say against the modern staging against it, I say against Puccini for Manon, because this r Roman was written in a certain time with a very specific, that's the same with Carmen, we can talk about Carmen, so Puccini, he should have called it uh, uh, Louis uh, 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 Chapeau, and then maybe I would accept it, but to say this is the story of <coughs> Abbé Prévost, no, nothing, has not, like Carmen, the problem of Carmen, that the Carmen of Mary May is still a little bit present in the, in the piece of uh, Bizet. The most Carmen we see nowadays have nothing to do with Carmen. But Traviata has, doesn't have that much to do with La Dame aux Camélias. Yes, Traviata you can do in a very different... Uh, you have to think about Traviata, what this is nowadays. Uh, I think Traviata exists now also. It's, uh, it's very difficult. I don't think what modern staging, where I'm completely against it, where it's only a whore. No, nothing to do with Traviata. Of course, she sold her services, but she was a very cultivated girl, and she sold it because she didn't have money. So there's already a social aspect of her, and there's another aspect that she defended in a very close uh, society, she was really a feminist, if I may say, uh, Traviata too. So I tried she once, feminist? yeah, she was in a certain way, she defended her, her position as a woman. It's a little Traviata, when you analyze, it has a little bit of Lulu, of Lulu already, yeah. Okay, can we, can we, can we, um, I, I think there's a obviously discussion a, a discussion to have here, and that uh, will be but very I interesting. Wanted but to but yes, no, of course, here, of course, yes, But yes. it's yeah. interesting, I, will, I want only to finish, uh, if you want to know a Traviata nowadays, uh, where you would say what is Traviata, I think Edith Piaf had something of Traviata. Great, thank you, and I hope you do continue the conversation <laughs> later. Um, anybody else like to um, say a fellow in the uh, striker shirt? Thank you very much for your talk and presentation yesterday, um, on Thursday and today. I'm a musicologist. I'm interested in um, what you discuss about brains, brain social social issues into contemporary times with respect for myself with respect to contemporary operas. So I'm, I'm asking a question in anticipation of the, uh, the forthcoming opera by Charles Wolverine, Wolverine on, uh, Bro on Brokeback Mountain. What are some of the challenges you see in staging this opera in Madrid as well as in uh, Vancouver, which sort of have different social, uh, political and uh, sort of historical background to the opera. You put, you put the finger in the wand. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell you, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question, because there you see that you have many times some compromises. I ordered this opera for the for the New York City Opera, where I thought it was absolutely perfect. And when I went away to Madrid, I was thinking long time if I would do it, because it's not the situation. And 
someone told me you should change it and put two toreros on the scene. So, but I'm sure I would be lynched. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely. But that would have been really the right decision. So if I may already say, because that would have put it in a certain way. But the film is not at all what we show in the opera. I, I, uh, I talked with Annie Proux, who wrote the libretto, who was not at all very uh, interested by the film. She didn't like the film at all. Because her propose was uh, I finally an impossible love for the larger society, but very strong, who goes on 25 years. And out of that point of view, and she rewrote also the text so that to make it very clear, I thought, OK, as I had this compromise with Charles Warren, I will do it in Madrid. And what I did also, I will play it at the same time of Tristan and Isolde. So I will try, uh, I think for me it's, I know with the actuality in Paris, I think um, it's, you could tell something much more profound about a love, what one of these two men doesn't understand, and he doesn't understand his love for Jack, but he doesn't come out of it. That's the same like Tristan. You know, he doesn't know how he can betray his greatest friend, Mark, eh? but he doesn't come out of it, and he wants to go into debt. And Ennis, it, so you can tell a beautiful story out of this more specific and Lee story, I think, that the film. And the music just, at, uh, it was very dangerous because it could become a Puccini opera. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's very, it's very, it's very yes, uh, it's uh, sentimental, sentimental yes, no? yes. At, at the end. So the compose, uh, composition style, uh, and that would be very dangerous. It become at the end a great aria when he sees the T-shirt yes. with the blood of his friend. Because of course, um, and Lee turned it into a very sentimental yeah, story. very sentimental. Yes, yes. So it's uh, composed in the. It's really a John Elliot Carter, a war -ridden, So really in the style of Alban Berg. I don't say it will become a good opera, but in any case, it can have a chance to communicate something. Thank you. And but and I can tell you how social, how social it is. When I was posted on the board of directors, the very right-wing party uh, in Spain, what we have a lot of them, uh, <laughs> asked me, uh, Mortier, what public you want <laughs> to, uh, for this opera? So I said, a liberal and international public. So the discussion uh, was out. But to tell that even to program this opera has a social, uh, value and uh, no in I think uh, it's it's a subject we can treat I think it would be fantastic now to program it in Paris at mm. this moment mm. any more questions please uh, yes what do you think of ancient in Britain's operas yes. <laughs> oh I, I like a lot I like enormously um, I did uh, do not so much I did uh, Benjamin Br uh, the Peter Grimes so this is one of the great operas Billy Bat too Billy Bat also uh, and um, I, I, I think, and what is it, it, what is my problem that I didn't program it this year? I should have done because it is birthday. Plus. I wanted to do that in Venice, but that in Venice for me a, a problem because the film already of Visconti was for me. When we are talking about to say, I think the film of Visconti, what was a beautiful film, has nothing to do for me with Thomas Mann. And therefore, that's what I mean uh, when I say Manon Lescaut, uh, Prévost, like Visconti said, as you can like the, uh, the opera Manon Lescaut, it has nothing to do with the Roman Abbe, Abbe Prévost, like, therefore, I think that in Venice is very difficult. You cannot make of the boy a dancer. Already it's finished for me. This, the idea of, the, of what is, you know. Any, any more? <coughs> this lady. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You spoke two nights ago a lot about the Greek theatre, and I'm very keen on the power of ritual. Oh. Uh, ritual. 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 Yeah. And in fact, I did find you out there and ask you about a person I find profoundly moving, which is Harrison Bertrissel. Yeah. And his two operas, Gawain and The Minotaur, just are lodged in me mm -hmm. in a way I can't explain except of the power almost cathartic power of ritual. Can you talk around that? 
bringing in also the value, um, the crisis of values that you mentioned. I'm really interested in that. Too. But I think the ritual is very important in all operas. Therefore, what we think, and that's my problem with veristic opera, mm -hmm. that opera is never veristic. Opera is always ritual. Um, I mean, and when you compose a quartet or a sextet, that's ritual for the musicologist, I think, that's a musical form who creates a ritual on the stage. And the only problem is of Greek tragedy in opera that most of the time the Greek tragedy is so strong that you very seldom can compose the music who makes more. Uh, it's, uh, I, I know very, and that Stravinsky understood very well when he did Oedip Roy, that he made the difference between the text and then very strong choruses. So to take a Greek tragedy as base of an opera is always difficult, that's uh, the first point. And the ritual is for me very important, but not only in, in, the, in the musical form, and great composers make rituals, therefore you have chorus. Chorus that's not realistic, <laughs> that people are singing together, yeah, but in such an artificial way. And the musical form, uh, I would say the most ritual opera is Alban Berg Wozzeck. That has nothing to do with realism. It has all to do with form. I just find here a marvelous book on Wozzeck, what uh, mm -hmm. Oxford Press has published. Uh, I don't know, if maybe you <laughs> know it already. It's a very interesting book just on analyzing how structures, how a ritual, because a, a ritual is a structure, is a form. Therefore, the more an opera has a form, a form, a musical form, uh, can be so well in the harmony. What is fantastic that Mozart, of course, at the end of his life, went into, in the, for example, when you listen to the chorale in the magic flute, uh, that he uses uh, the contrapunt, that he uses the tonality of the Frank Masons, and that he always brings this together, or that he at once starts the contrapunt and the sonata form. The more an opera has a form, the stronger he is. And that's the problem of Contemporary. perfect America. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Anybody else? A uh, lady in white. From your uh, career perspective, personal career perspective. Can you speak From your personal career perspective, yeah. what would you like your legacy to be? Oh, no, that's not we. You don't <laughs> decide that for yourself. That's the other <laughs> one who will decide. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you decide. I think. That's not so imp it's not important. Are, are there things that you're particularly proud of, though, t in terms of... Uh, proud, I don't know. Oh. I, I, I would say that I tried... It, you know, the productions, that's something... And there you are right. The productions, as a, w as a whole, it gets very, very quick old-fashioned. Even I have done some productions where I was very proud of uh, 20 years ago, and I would say, oh, well, yeah, that was good. In this time, I would not do it again. It's very few products. So you see how quickly the production and even the interpretation of music, who quickly it can become old. You know, there was a time we all liked Karl Böhm in Mozart. Now you can't listen anymore to it. And it's, you are, I, I liked it, and I said, but how was it possible? You know, it's so that, but I was young. So, it, so the, the production is not important. The only thing what I hope is that through my work, opera as an art form goes on in existing. But it will exist differently in the future. So I don't want that uh, opera will always play it. I would say, I give an example, Greek tragedy. It's for sure that nowadays we never play a Greek tragedy in the sense the Greeks have done it, for sure. But nowadays, still, Antigone and the back canton still works for our time. That means that the art theatre was so enormously 2,000 years ago that we, modern people, can still have emotion in seeing Antigone, in seeing the back. That's the same with Shakespeare. You will never in 2,000 years from now, the monologue from Hamlet, always Shakespeare 
would stay because it's such a great artwork. And the thing we are, opera directors, doing to make opera as good as we can so that the great artworks, they will survive. Uh, but many, some, we have to help a little bit. So for example, Watzek or, um, or Saint-Francois, we have first to help that we played much more. I'm yeah. very happy that now the Lachenmann piece at next year three new productions. So that's our only work we can do. That it doesn't forget that we play against the soldat and of Zimmerman. And then after that, when our piece is strong, it survives. Even without our help, <laughs> I would say. So I think that the opera will survive but probably in another in another uh, manner. I don't know how, but uh, there will be al always musical theatre, I think so. And um, a lot of the pieces will not survive, that's for sure. And I would say thanks to God. That <laughs> <they will. laughs> Otherwise, it's good that if you would keep all the arts, what was created, God said that only the good is surviving. No, that's well, uh, that's, a, that's a very positive note. We, 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 are, we are just about to run out of time, but I think we can take a couple, couple more questions very quickly. Is there anybody else who'd like to ask anything? Or? Okay, one more here. Yeah. I'd like to just point out an earlier question about opera which transfer in time and place. I think Rigoletto is a supreme example of one which should be played in any, almost any time in any place. And it would have been many versions in Latvia and trains in New York and Kennedy White House. Mm -hmm. Quite unusual, and the old world, the well set of set, set, social set up, that you set up, we were exploited mm -hmm. almost entirely in time place. Yeah, for me, I have the, I never did Rigoletto because I didn't find a solution. So I know that there is a lot of people who think it's easy. For me, it's not easy at all because the music is really great of Verdi, you know. The but we have such <coughs> so many traditions. I will tr tell one one example. Um, the music is fantastic. It's the first time in romantic music that you have a really music of the night, the opening of the second scene with the contrabasses. That's uh, for the musical it's really night music. So I, I adore musically the piece. The piece was completely destroyed by conventions who are not in the score. And I give one example. One of the uh, one of the great moments is when Rigoletto st uh, comes out of the malediction of uh, Mont Montero, uh, yes. eh? Monteroni, and he comes at home completely <sighs> out, destroyed, and he says, at one moment he says, folia, folia. It's in the score piano. And then ta 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 for selling women and, and so that's uh, it was an attack on Francois Premier and how to tell this nowadays maybe I should try it one day <laughs> but I'm very afraid because I would change it musically and uh, and so but you are right it's played because people come only to hear La Donne Aimable and so on what is not the best moment of the opera that's a little bit Philip Glass and the opera <laughs> and uh, or uh, even Tosca yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So um, voilà. and but so you will see it enough, it, they will play it everywhere. It's, uh, it's, uh, the problem is, is um, I see the, the disabled, uh, the figure of mm. uh, Rigoletto is very, very strange. Mm. I mean, we, we do have to, to wind up now and uh, we are having a drink afterwards so we can continue conversations, um, I hope. Um, and it would just be good, I mean, I, you know, there are quite a few um, uh, young, young faces around, people who are just starting out their careers. Um, perhaps you could just wind up by telling us in 
oh. a minute. Um, oh. <laughs> what, what, what it takes to be a great opera uh, administrator, director, intendant, impresario, um, what, what qualities do you need? Work it. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only, no, I think I'm not a musicologist, so I, but it's working. It's really, you have to know that a theatre, you cannot read, you have to be very often in the theatre. That's first of all. You have to have good people around you. You have to work in the keep because it's too much art. You have to good, a good people who knows really, I need always people who knows even better as me music so I can talk with them. Uh, of course, you have to know uh, about voices and so on, but it's out of opera is many out of uh, of knowing, and the second value is passion for theater. It must be the greatest passion in your life. If you have not the passion for theater, don't do theater, because and I see that all. I am not a creator, but when you read uh, Mozart, uh, Shakespeare, all the they had the passion. Verdi has an enormous passion. Without this passion. It doesn't work. Um, and I, I also think that one of the things that Gerard's been uh, amazing at in, in his career is to, is to always have the courage of his convictions and, and to not be afraid of um, upsetting people, but to do it with, with great charm and great insight. Um, and he's been, a, he's been a wonderful force for, for, for good, and he's certainly kept um, our pens very busy um, <laughs> over, over a number of years. Um, so Gerard, thank you very, very much Thanks for joining too. us. Thank um, you. <laughs>